So a prelude before the sermon, or as one minister once said, I'd like to say something to you before I preach. <laughs> uh, the sermon today begins with an extended quote by the author Frederick Beekner. Do you know Frederick Beekner? Well, you will after this morning. In my estimation, the most gifted Christian writer in a generation. He died in 2022, last year. So he's written a multitude of things and they're all worth reading. So I'll identify the quote. Just know the sermon begins with this quote and it concludes with a song. And both the quote and the song should be considered part of the sermon. All right? All right, now I'll preach. <laughs> the quote. The preacher pulls a little cord that turns on the lectern light and deals out his note cards like a riverboat gambler. The stakes have never been higher. Two minutes from now, he may have lost his listeners completely to their own thoughts. But at this minute, he has them in the palm of his hand. The silence in the church is deafening because everybody is listening to it. Everybody is listening, including even himself. Everybody knows the kind of things he has told them before and not told them. But who knows what this time, out of silence, he will tell them. Let him tell them the truth. Before the gospel is a word, it is silence. It is the silence of their own lives and of his life. It is life with the sound turned off so that for a moment or two, you can experience it not in terms of the words you make it bearable by, but for the unutterable mystery that it is. Let him say, be silent and know that I am God, saith the Lord. Be silent and know that even by my silence and absence I am known. Be silent and listen to the stones cry out. Out of the silence let the only real news come, which is sad news before it is glad news, and that is fairy tale last of all. The preacher is not brave enough to be literally silent for long, and since it is his calling to speak the truth with love, even if he were brave enough, he would not be silent for long because we are none of us very good at silence. It says too much. So let him use words, but in addition to using them to explain, expound, exhort, let him use them to evoke to set us dreaming as well as thinking, to use words as at their most prophetic and truthful, the prophets use them, to stir in us memories and longings and intuitions that we starve for without knowing that we starve. Let him use words which do not only try to give answers to the questions that we ask or ought to ask, but which help us to hear the questions that we do not have words for asking and to hear the silence that those questions rise out of and the silence that is the answer to those questions. Drawing on nothing fancier than the poetry of his own life, let him use words and images that help make the surfaces of our lives transparent to the truth that lies deep within them, which is the wordless truth of who we are and who God is and the gospel of our meeting. End of quote. I have no note cards, just an electronic tablet containing words I composed for this morning, my words breaking the silence, often telling us more than my words can. I cannot shuffle my pages to make something new or different from what I wrote. <laughs> 
An interim pastor search committee member once asked if I could juggle like the last fill-in they had who entertained the children with his hand-eye coordination and his pastoral message. I told the person the only thing I had ever successfully juggled were words. Though that's not completely true since I've preached from the lectionary text for over 30 years. Each Sunday I have been presented with four or five texts from which I have selected my themes and composed a message. I've juggled lectionary texts on a three-year rotation. Over the course of my ministry, I've shuffled them more than a time or two, choosing a psalm over a Pauline epistle or a text from the Older Testament rather than the newer one. But I've almost always played the lectionary cards I was dealt. To be honest, and as Beekner pointed out, there's little use in preaching if one isn't. I don't care much for today's text. <laughs> I'm willing to admit my lack of affinity may have far more to do with the text of my life than the life of these texts. I don't think these passages clearly present the compassionate God I love the God who loves us all unconditionally. Continue that, consider that continuing saga of Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Hagar, and Ishmael. Sarah, Hagar's wife, had presented uh, Hagar, Sarah, Abraham's wife, had presented Hagar, Sarah's servant, as a surrogate wife for Abraham so he might have a son. Their union was successful, and Ishmael became Abraham's firstborn. Then, as happens sometimes when a childless couple decides to adopt, Sarah becomes pregnant and gives birth to Isaac. Even before Sarah's belly was swollen with child, her heart was inflamed with jealousy. By the time Isaac was born, Sarah was convinced the tent was not roomy enough for Hagar and Ishmael to stick around. Sarah told Abraham to get rid of Hagar and her firstborn, his firstborn too. Abraham was reluctant, but God told him everything would work out, so Abraham gave Hagar and his son enough food and water to get out of eyesight, but not enough to survive. God inter intervened after Hagar was convinced her son would perish, and placed him in the shade so he could die without staring at her or the blinding sun. There was water nearby after all, and God promised Hagar her son would be a great nation too, and well, all's well that ends well. The ends somehow justifying the meanness of Sarah, Abraham, and even God. It's a tragedy superseded only by Abraham's willingness to offer up his other son, Isaac, as a human sacrifice to God. But as we'll learn in a few chapters, that ended well too, since the only, he only bound his son on an altar and drew back a knife. God spared Isaac too, though I wonder if Isaac ever, get, ever gave Abraham a Father's Day gift after that. I doubt Ishmael even sent a card, <laughs> though he and Isaac were in attendance at their father's funeral. I wonder when God speaks to us in crystal clear tones that seem contrary to the nature and character of God, if we're hearing what we believed God would say. I wonder if we sometimes put words in God's mouth that God wishes weren't there. I wish some words that were that are attributed to have come from Jesus' mouth hadn't escaped his lips. I mean, I rejoice God watches over the sparrow and watches over us too, and I'm glad God knows the number of the hairs on each of our heads, though for some of us, that's a fairly simple calculation. <laughs> In the succeeding paragraphs, Jesus sounds, well, less than compassionate. He places conditions on his willingness to acknowledge us, a kind of theological quid pro quo. He tells us he isn't the Prince of Peace, but a Savior with a sword. 
He would later tell Peter to put his sword away. But in this passage, Jesus brandishes his. Jesus said he would set family members at odds with each other, though from my experience, we don't need Jesus' help for families to become divided. Many families seem quite capable of becoming cantankerous and difficult without any additional outside assistance. Just a week after Father's Day, Jesus says love for family takes second place to love for him. Those who refuse to live that way aren't worthy of Jesus. And here I thought one of the major points of the gospel is that none of us are ever worthy of Jesus loving us. I better understand the part about taking up the cross, living a life of sacrificial love, but it's a bit difficult to square sacrificial love with family enmity. In order to begin to catch on to what Jesus meant, we have to be willing to lose everything he said, and when we do, we'll discover life. That's, what, that's Jesus' premise and promise to us. It's a stretch to read these passages and arrive at the conclusion, God is love. There's no love in the expulsion of Hagar and Ishmael. The just-in-time provision of God must have let mother and child emotionally reeling and theologically confused about God's grace, mercy, love, and compassion. Jesus' promise regarding God's care for pheasants and follicles is nice, and though the promise about family divisions and enmity may well be true, it isn't reassuring or restorative. I understand Jesus' words to mean that when we have to choose between what Dad says and what God says, well, choose what God says. When we come to a time when we have to decide whether to do as Mother does or as God does, choose what God does. Though one might want to focus on the times God is clearly acting and speaking, in compassionate and loving ways. Later in the gospel story, in another section of text, Jesus is asked what matters to him and to God. He responds to care for those for whom others don't, visit those others don't see, feed those who are hungry, and provide shelter for those who have no home. Recognize each and every person as a child of God and treat them as God's children. I think that's the gospel truth. And I hardly hear an echo of that within these texts. My family and I went to a Nationals game this past Monday, believing it's better to watch them lose in person than watch them lose on TV. <laughs> on the way home, we traveled under an overpass that provided a roof over the heads of folks who had no roof of their own. An array of tents filled the sidewalk and my soon-to-be six-year-old granddaughter initiated this conversation with her father sitting beside her. Why are those tents there? Those tents are people's homes. Why don't they have a home? They can't afford one. Why don't they go to a motel? They don't have any money. Why don't they have any money? I suppose some of underpass and underprivileged residents may be separated or cleave from their father or mother. I suppose God knows a number of the hairs on their heads, so that divine knowledge hasn't done them much earthly good. Perhaps some of them have been cast out because of jealousy or because the place where they lived wasn't big enough for them and those who refused or couldn't care for them. I'm certain every one of those tent dwellers has a story, and I imagine compassion is seldom the thing. If we sat and talked with those folks beneath the overpass, I imagine they would tell us they got a raw deal. They've tried to do the best they could with the hand they were dealt. And so have I this morning, and every morning I've had the privilege to preach. Though I'm unwilling to shuffle these lectionary texts, I could arrange my understanding. A great friend suggested Hagar and Ishmael had to leave because the animosity between Hagar and Sarah was so great it could destroy them all. <laughs> 
Maybe their situation was similar to a married couple who decided to go their separate ways because the constant friction is more damaging and hurtful than divorce. Perhaps the gospel writer didn't articulate the clear distinction between reason and result when he remembered and wrote down Jesus' words. Jesus emphatically stated people were now faced with a life-altering decision to follow him. Making that decision could separate one from the folks they greatly love when those they love could not or would not take up a cross and follow Jesus. Separation wasn't Jesus' intention. Separation was a consequence of family members choosing different paths. Perhaps compassion is in the background of both texts, but it's not front and center. I've always thought compassion comprised the introduction and the conclusion to God's story. If I could stack the lectionary deck, I'd make sure the cards of grace, mercy, forgiveness, compassion, and love comprised each hand and caressed each hand in need of kindness. A friend emailed me this week and said, the universe doesn't really need us since we do more harm than help it. <laughs> he asked, what's our reason for being? I suggested we're the only portion of creation capable of sacrificial love. Us, well, and dogs, and other animals possessing a semblance of sentience and commitment to community. I'm concerned what matters most of all to the folks beneath the overpass and the person sitting beside you this morning is how we love. <laughs>